Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to um, take in your word, and we thank you, Lord, for this local assembly. We pray that you might continue to strengthen it. I pray that each and every believer might realize that they are gifted with a spiritual gift, and they are to use that gift for the benefit of one another. I pray, Lord, that we might encourage one another, we might pray for one another, that we might um, minister to one another, that we might uh, be an example of Christ's likeness, to bear one another's burdens. Father, I pray that you might use us to your honor and glory, and as we take in your word, Lord, that we might know more about you and your Son, know his character, his greatness, Lord, and identify with his sufferings, as Paul said. Uh, I pray, Father, that we might continue to focus upon your truth and help us to run this race with perseverance, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. Sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, uh, John chapter 7, and uh, we are on verse 25, John 7:25. I want to read uh, verses 25 down through verse 31. Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the religious, uh, do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes... No one knows where he is from. And Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me and know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? Uh, in this section of the Word of God, we have various individuals who believe different things about the Messiah. Different things about the Messiah. Um, Wilmington summarizes this in his outline Bible. Uh, Jesus mix, had a mixed reception while attending the festival of booze or shelters in chapter 7, verses 11 through 53. We had uh, reactions from the people. Some felt he was a good man, in verses 11 and 12. Uh, notice here, they didn't renounce him. Uh, verse 12, it says, some said he is good. He's good. He's a good man. And uh, they went no further. Uh, some said, no, he is a deceiver. He deceives the people. He deceives the people. Others, notice in verse 12, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. Some felt that he was demon-possessed. They went even a step further. They said, no, this individual is demon-possessed. The people answered and said, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Some felt he's simply an ordinary man in verses 25 and 27 and verses 41b and 42. He's just an ordinary man. And then some felt he was a prophet. So you see the mixed opinions of who Jesus is and who the Messiah. Some finally identified and said, no, this is truly the Messiah, the Son of God. So you have a range of um, opinions on who Jesus was in this section. Now, part of the crowd said, is this not the person whom the leaders were seeking to kill? Uh, and therefore they thought that this is the one. Earlier in verse 19, we see clearly the intention, uh, Jesus said uh, to some of these leaders, you intend to kill me, that's your motive. Uh, verse 19, did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you seek to kill me? And they responded, well, no one's, gonna, no one's trying to kill you. You must be demon-possessed. You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Well, Jesus knew their hearts. He knew their intentions. And so the other part of the crowd said, you know, is this the one 
who these leaders seek to kill, and clearly he is the one they sought to kill. Uh, in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, Edward Bloom says this, Some of the local people were amazed at his bold public teaching. They knew of a plot to kill him, yet the leaders were not doing what they said they would do. Why? Had the authorities changed their minds? People were confused over the lack of leadership in the nation. They felt that if he was a deceiver, he should be locked up. Or if he was the Messiah, they should accept him. And they're confused at, you know, how they approach Jesus. And therefore, uh, that created the division in the crowd. However, verse 27, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Now, they thought they knew him, but they really didn't know who he was. Okay? We're aware, we're aware of uh, Jesus. They had a human viewpoint of Jesus, but not a divine viewpoint. We know where this man is from. Now, that's not a positive statement. I think that's the idea of looking at Jesus only through human lenses instead of the scripture. Some Jews of Jesus' day apparently were of the opinion that no one would recognize the true origin of the Messiah when he did appear. They had a fault of you. They said no one will know his background when he arises on the scene. Uh, given that premise, that faulty premise, I would say, they concluded that Jesus could not possibly have been the Messiah. You know, since we know that Jesus is from Nazareth, and that's the implication, therefore he's not the Messiah. Because Messiah, when he comes, no one will know his origins. And that's a wrong view. And they did not get that from the Word of God. They were ignorant of the Old Testament scriptures about the Messiah. They apparently thought that he came from Galilee. Uh, we see that in verse 41. Uh, others said, this is the Christ, but some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? Where is there any prophecy about Christ coming out of Galilee? But that wasn't, he ministered in Galilee, but that wasn't his origin. He was born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. Uh, he came from above in John 1, 1. He is the eternal Logos, Micah 5, 2 as well. His going forth had been from old, from eternity past. And so, because he came from Galilee, or a minister in Galilee, they concluded that, well, he's not truly the Messiah. So, uh, when Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. Uh, they were ignorant of the word of God. Now, Jesus met two disciples after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus. And we're familiar with that passage, that they were discussing the events of the week, including the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. And Christ appeared to them, and he chided them in verse 25. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. I think that same rebuke could be said of many individuals in this crowd. Um, your fool, foolish do not believe all the prophets, what they have predicted about the Messiah. You're ignorant of those things. Ought not the Christ, the Messiah, to have suffered these things and then entered into his glory? His death is predicted in the Old Testament, his resurrection, ultimately his exaltation. Psalm 110.1, at the right hand of the Father, his future glorification. Verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Notice he included the Pentateuch because we had that prophecy of the prophet coming. And that's one of the designations of the Messiah in the book of Deuteronomy. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It's amazing when we study the Old Testament scriptures that... Um, there are, uh, are at least a hundred, and I think it was some one writer, I think Dave Reagan, counted 109 prophecies of Christ's first coming. 109. And during his death, we at least have two or three dozen. In that last week of Christ's death is last week, the Passion Week, we would call it, at least several dozen prophecies that were fulfilled in the Old Testament. 
And then Edersheim was a Messianic Jew in, I think, the late 1800s. Uh, he said there's 333 prophecies of Christ's second coming. So the Old Testament is full of scripture pointing to the Messiah. All that evidence. But uh, they had a faulty theory uh, because they were ignorant of the word of God. I think that's very important in light of where we're living today. How many people are ignorant and unaware of the imminent return of Christ for the church? How often is that proclaimed? How often is that preached? What you view about the future affects the way you live today. And there, therefore, if one-third or one-fourth of the Bible, some have said up to 27% of the Bible was predicted when written, if that is true, then we should not ignore the prophetic word of God. It's very important to know the times that we are living in. Now, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Paul writes to the Thessalonian believers, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. He said, something, this is something I've taught you again and again. This is something that's mentioned in the Old Testament, the coming time of judgment after the rapture. Uh, the rapture is not revealed in the Old Testament, but the day of the Lord judgment will come unexpectedly upon the unbeliever, but you, believer, are exempt from that future judgment. He teaches certainly the preacher of rapture and uh, this section of scripture. But he says, you know the times and the seasons and affected the way they live because if Christ has already come, uh, then that would, uh, that would negatively affect how they lived their life. Some people today teach that he already came in a mystical, non-literal way, praetorist. Book of Revelation is in the rear view mirror. It's already in the past. And they literally steal the believer's hope and confidence. They rob them of that truth. Um, and then we have to look at the environment and, and the culture and uh, wallow in sorrow, uh, wallow in fear, not knowing that Christ is coming. And that gives us hope and confidence. And God's plan is progressing. And we need to know those things. Look at verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians 5. But let us who are of the day be sober. We don't belong, by the way, to the day of the Lord. That's a day of night and judgment, darkness. We're of the day. Notice what we need to put on. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, we have the listing of the armor. You remember the helmet of salvation. How do we interpret that? Is that salvation from sin's penalty? No, we already have that as a believer. Think about that. He's telling a believer to put on the armor. You don't need to put on the helmet of salvation. As far as from sin's penalty, you already have salvation. So what salvation is he referring to? That future third tense Salvation from the power of presence of sin at the coming of Christ for the church. That anticipation of your glorification. That hope we need to put on to protect our thinking. And I think today in this political season, we need to put especially on that helmet, that hope of our future glorification to guard and protect us, our thinking. So putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation, continue reading verse 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the glorification of our bodies. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we're alert or not when he returns, we will live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and what? Build up one another, edify one another, encourage one another, just as you are doing. See how that prophecy has a practical effect in your daily life. Understanding the truth, understanding the order of events, very important. And so their faulty view of the Messiah 
caused them to miss and recognize that Jesus was the one. They were ignorant of the word of God. We live in a biblically illiterate society. We have brilliant individuals out there, but they're illiterate of the Bible. You go back a couple decades ago and you see in the culture Bible verses quoted. And I'm amazed of Bible verses quoted in certain Westerns. And I'm like, that's used in a right way. <laughs> and I'm, I'm astounded. How do they pull out this prophecy from Jeremiah? How do they pull Hollywood? But not so today. Not so today. We don't know the word of God and therefore we live in fear. We live in panic. We live in worry. We need to know the prophetic word of God. We need to know about the Savior and therefore the prophetic scripture concerning him. Now, uh, Ronald Trail in his exegetical summary said this, Just a martyr in his work dialogue, dialogue with Trifo held the view that the Messiah would be born of flesh and blood but would be unknown until the time that he made his appearance to deliver Israel. This same idea is seen in statements by the rabbis. The people expected that the Messiah would make his appearance suddenly, all at once, and no one would be able to tell anything about his background or origins. Justin Martyr had it wrong. Now this is very important, and I'll just make some application here. There are those who say we cannot interpret the Bible literally. We need to move away from literal interpretation. And we need to look at certain historians, Josephus, Justin Martyr. They're good on certain points, points of history. And maybe even extra biblical writings to help us understand the book of Revelation. And they have a whole class called apocalyptic genre that they impose upon the text of the word of God. Instead of the Old Testament scriptures such as Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, interpreting literally about Christ coming and the first coming and then how he comes in the second coming. And so they try to put a Jewish spin, a pessimistic spin on the word of God by individuals that more than likely were unbelievers. Think about that. Now, don't get me wrong, Justin Martyr has some good history of the culture in that day, Josephus as well. Certain things we can learn by the Maccabees, but you know what? That's not scripture. We always have to realize that. That's not the word of God. And so our first go-to resource is the word of God. What saith the, not Justin Martyr, what saith Josephus, what saith the, scriptures that's always our go-to not even the church fathers got everything right i like what spurgeon said about the church fathers studying them now we can learn a little bit about church history certainly but you know what spurgeon says church fathers i'm more concerned with the grandfathers meaning the authors of scripture such as paul and peter that's where we stop off. That's our ultimate source. And we have to be careful when we try to go beyond the word of God. We can learn some inter interesting points, but ultimately sometimes these guys did not have it right. They did not have it right because they're coming from an unbelieving perspective. And keep in mind, the Holy Spirit needs to illuminate the truth to our mind and soul. By the way, Praetorists, you know what? Praetorists, they quote Josephus. That's their Bible. You ever read any writing about Praetorists? Referencing Josephus, 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 Josephus. Instead of Daniel, Isaiah, Jeremiah. I'd rather go to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel to determine how we view the end times than Josephus or just a martyr. All right. Now, they had a faulty view. They had a faulty view in that day of the appearance of the Messiah. The Judeans were evidently unaware of Old Testament prophecies that said that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. Let's look at that passage. Micah, Micah, 
chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, there's another Bethlehem. That's why we sing the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, distinguishing this smaller city of Bethlehem. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one who to be ruler in Israel. Notice here the second half of the verse, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting. That refers to his deity. Being born in Bethlehem refers to his humanity. Messiah would be both God and man. He would be the God-man. He would be born in Bethlehem, but ultimately he is eternal in nature. He's from heaven. If they understood that prophecy, they would be in agreement with Jesus' teaching about the bread coming down from heaven. They would understand that he is divine. They missed it. They missed the prophetic scripture. And therefore, they rejected, based on tradition, the, the who Christ was. And another thing, too, do we accept tradition above the word of God? People's opinion about Christ, human viewpoint, or the word of God. It's the word of God. He would be called a Nazarene since he was raised in Nazareth. Now, people confuse that Matthew 2.23. I just want to make a comment. That's an interesting passage. Look at, let's look at Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2.23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, what does that mean, that he would be called a Nazarene? Let's take a look at that passage then. Uh, Geisler has a great summary of various views of how to interpret that. Number one, some point to the fact that Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirement of the Old Testament law, one part of which involved the holy commitment made in the vow of Nazarite, of the Nazarite. The Nazarite vow took this vow to separate himself to the Lord. And Jesus perfectly fulfilled this. However, the word is different both in Hebrew and Greek. And Jesus never took that vow. By the way, this is where we get a faulty view of Christ's appearance. You know, Nazarite, Samson, he refused to cut his hair. Therefore, we have the hippie Jesus, right? The hippie Jesus. Where does that come from, that concept? It comes from a faulty view of this passage. A faulty interpretation of, well, he took, he's a Nazarite. He took a Nazarite vow, therefore he let his hair grow. And, you know, that's how why you see depictions of Jesus with long hair. Now, I think he's more like a Roman. He, he uh, you know, but we can argue that. But the point is, I don't think that that's what he's referring to here. He didn't take the Nazarite vow. He... That wasn't the issue here. It's similar in sounding, but that, that doesn't mean that he was a Nazarite, taking the Nazarite vow. Number two, second view, other point to the fact that Nazar comes from the basic word netzer, or branch. Many prophets spoke of the Messiah as the branch. Um, Isaiah uses that reference, Isaiah 11.1, 1, Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Jeremiah 33, 15, Zechariah 3.8. And Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12. It's a possibility. But I think this third view I lean toward. Others hold, note that the city of Nazareth where Jesus lived was a despised place on the other side of the tracks. This is evident in Nathaniel's response in John 1, 46. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Like, can anything good come out of San Francisco? <laughs> uh, but in this sense, Nazarene was a term, a term of scorn appropriate to the Messiah whom the prophets predicted would be despised and rejected of men. And where he grew up depicted the, the nature of Christ, the fact that he was rejected of men rejected of men. Isaiah 53, verse 3, 
Song 22, 6, Daniel 9, 26, Zechariah 12, 10. So I think that idea that he identified with a town that was despised, and that's where he grew up. But he was born in Bethlehem. Born in Bethlehem. You remember the wise men, they came searching for Jesus, uh, and they inquired about the location of his birth. Let's look back at Matthew chapter 2. Um, going back to verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from east, they came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who had been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star. Was that a comment? No. <laughs> I want to say that. Uh, you, we sing the Christmas hymn with, uh, this is kind of a secular hymn too, with, with the tail as big as a kite, you know, hinting that it was a comet. No, it wasn't a comet. Was it an alignment of planets, Jupiter uh, and Saturn? Uh, no. Uh, was it any, any kind of starry phenomenon? No, I think it was simply the Shekinah glory of God because the star stood over the exact location where Christ uh, was born. And therefore, no other star or planet or comet or any other event in the sky can do that. It was supernatural. And therefore, I think it was the glory of God appearing. Uh, remember, the shepherds saw the glory of God and also the angels, and therefore I think that's a hint at this star. Word star, by the way, in the Greek means simply something that shines, or something that shines bright. It doesn't necessarily mean, if it can refer to physical stars in the sky, but it simply means something that's bright, a bright light. And therefore I think the bright light was the Shekinah glory of God. They came to worship him, these kings from the east, these magi, how, why would they come, by the way? Prophet Daniel. The timing of Christ. Remember the Daniel 77. They knew that it was approaching. And therefore, they understood as magi. Remember Daniel's court, they were wise men. These individuals in the area of Babylon, East Babylon, I think they came from Babylon, to seek the Messiah. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them, where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. They at least had that right. Think about it. They understood that. The Bible indicated that Christ would be born in Bethlehem. And he quoted here uh, Micah chapter 5. But this crowd, they held on to a faulty theory that contradicted the scripture. The word of God. Verse 28. Now Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple saying, You both know me and you know where I'm from. I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true whom you do not know. Now when you read this and you're doing basic Bible interpretation, you're looking at this just in the observation stage and you're thinking, one of these things is not like the other. You're saying, you know me, but yet you don't know me. How can that be true? You know me, Jesus said, but then you don't know me. Well, doing a word study, is it the same Greek word? Yes. Yes, it is the same Greek word. Some say, well, maybe he's asking, uh, he's not making a statement. He is implying, asking a question. You should put a question mark there. So that's how... This text is resolved in some authors. But I don't, think, I don't think that that's the case. I think he's thinking that you know something about me, but you really don't know me completely. And that's the idea. You think you know some information about my family, about my city that I grew up in, but yet you really don't know me as the Messiah. I think that's in essence what he's saying here. Um, now, notice how he started. He, he cried out. He cried out. Don't get upset when preachers raise their voice once in a while. Jesus cried out. He did so, I think, for emphasis. 
as he taught in the temple, saying, you both know me and you know where I am from. Now, that was a common area we saw in, you know, last time we were going through this text, the, the prior verses, the portico of Solomon's temple would be the area where he would be teaching, probably under one of those columns. And that was a large open area. You could fit over 70,000 people in that courtyard, uh, in that temple area. And so he was in the temple area precinct, teaching the word of God. And he indicated that you both know me and know where I'm from and not come of myself. Now, the word oida in this context means to know about someone. It doesn't necessarily here mean you have complete information uh, necessarily, but you know something about me, I would say. I would translate, you know something about me, something about me. It's true that they knew him and his family, but there was more to know. We know that because in chapter 6, verse 42, he said this. He said, is, this not, is, this not, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? That's true, right? Whose father and mother we know? Yeah, from a human perspective. How is it then that he says, I've come down from heaven? They didn't know that part. See, they knew about the human Jesus, but they did not know about the divine Jesus. They saw him as only a human being. They understood a little bit about his family, a little bit about where he grew up, his background, but failed to realize that he was the prophesied Messiah. They really had no personal relationship with him. So they knew something about his family, something about the background, where he came from, but not completely. I was thinking about this, how today people know some information about Jesus, right? A lot of people are taught some of the basic Bible stories about Jesus, but they have no relationship with the Savior. God doesn't want you to simply know information about Jesus, some information. God wants you to recognize who he is and therefore believe the fact that he can give eternal life. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Paul was saying that we understood the human Jesus. We understood information about him. But we really didn't know him as the Savior. And that's the tragedy of today. People who have the moral Jesus in mind, right? The social Jesus in mind, but not the Savior Jesus. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 um, Paul speaks about, uh, later on in this chapter, and he talks about uh, knowing Christ, knowing him, not simply in a superficial level, but knowing him as Savior. Now, look at verse 28. So he says, uh, back again at the text, he, he says here, you know where I am from. They knew that he came from Nazareth. They knew a little bit about his family. Uh, but he says, I have not come of myself. Meaning that I'm not here pushing my own agenda. I came from the Father. I'm here to accomplish his will, plan, and purpose. So he's not simply doing his own initiative. He's doing what the Father wants him to do. And that, by the way, is all the way through the Gospel of John. I've come to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Over and over, that theme is repeated in the Gospel of John. John chapter 4, verse 34. Similar words here. 
Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And so he came to accomplish the Father's will. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 38 through 40. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I shall lose nothing, but will raise it up at the last day. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He could secure that promise through his substitutionary death on the cross. I love Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 6. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. We have what is called the kenosis prescription. If a doctor writes you a prescription, you need to do this. Go to the drugstore and get X, Y, and Z. And we had the prescription. Pay for the sins of the world through your death on the cross. Here you go. Finish and complete that. Be faithful to death. That was a kenosis prescription given to the Messiah, the Son of God. He took on the form of a bond servant. He humbled himself. The idea of his humiliation. He did not give up any attribute of deity. He did not give up his omniscience, his omniscient, omnipotence, his omnipresence. You say he was in a body. Yeah, but he told Nathaniel, I saw you under a fig tree. He did not give up his omnipresence, his omniscience. Jesus Christ gave up his position, his exalted position in the heavens, and took on human nature in a lowly place called Bethlehem to die for us. He did not remain in heaven. He did not think it was a thing to be held on to at all costs. But he made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant. Now, if you have Jehovah's Witness who try to argue, you know, he was in the form of God, but he's not God. The same exact Greek word is used, form of a servant. Was he less than a servant? Think about it. No, the idea is he had all the trappings of deity. He doesn't, that doesn't mean his deity was taken away, but he had the glory in the heavens as he he prayed this in John 17, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He veiled that glory in a human body. And therefore he took upon himself a servant's form, human nature, coming in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, but even a particular type of death, death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given the name, him the name which is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow on things in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It doesn't mean that everyone will be saved, but everyone will have to recognize his sovereignty one day. And Jesus Christ is the one who was obedient to the Father's will. Hebrews is very clear about this. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7 and 10. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume, the scroll of the book. It is written to me to do your will, O God. I have come to accomplish your will, Father. And sacrifice and offerings could never ever deal finally with sin. But Jesus Christ in his body paid for our sins. As a result, in verse 10, by that will, by his obedience unto death, even death on the cross, we have been set apart, sanctified, through the offering of the body of Christ once. Hapax, never to be repeated, once for all. So we receive the result of his obedience. Payment of sins and the giving of everlasting life. 
I did not come to accomplish my own agenda. I came on a mission to accomplish the Father's will. And the one who sent me is true. Is true. God the Father is the one who is described as true. John 8, 26 and 27. But you know what? Your problem, you do not have a relationship with me. Now when you study the lexicons, by the way, hermeneutical, here's a tip on hermeneutics. All right. You don't have, you can look at an identical Greek word in the same verse and have two different meanings. Here's one example of this, oida. Two different meanings. You know something about me, about my family, about my background, but you really don't have, here the word is used of a relationship. You do not have a relationship with me. You do not know me as your Savior. You do not know me as the Messiah, as the Anointed One, as the Christ. And therefore, you are liable. Notice verse 29. But I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. I have a relationship with a God whom you do not know. Why? I came from him. Wow. Wow. Imagine how astounding this was to those listening. I'm from him. And you know what? He sent me here. He sent me here. I know him. You don't. You don't. The word, by the way, in the Greek is ego. The word for I, and it's first in the sentence. When you have a Greek word that seems out of order, in the English we, we think, you know, in the Greek here, it... it uh, is placed in first in the sentence. The idea is emphasis. So scholar, Greek scholars have taken this in the contrast, I, we could say, know him. Verse 28, you don't know him, but I, I know him. That's the emphasis. I know him. Um, now, the reason why Jesus knows God is because eternally he was with God. Think about the beginning in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The word Greek word, there is the word pros. It's a Greek preposition, and it means, we could translate it, face to face with God. The Logos, the Word, was eternally face-to-face -face in fellowship with the Father. Amazing. Through eternity past. God did not create man because he was lonely. That's faulty. God created man so there will be creatures that could glorify him. Jesus Christ was eternally with the Father. I know him. Because I have been with him. And the only time in eternity that he was separated from this father was when he died on the cross. When he screamed out for three hours, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Fellowship with God is broken for the first time in eternity past to that present time. I know him because I am from him. He sent me. The emphasis, this is the emphasis of the bread of life discourse. I am from the Father. The Father sent me. Uh, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. You can read this over and over in this discourse in John 6, 42 and verse 46 through 51. I originated from him. Why? Because he sent me. Let's take a look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to do what? Condemn the world. Isn't that what most unsaved people think? You know, you're just here to look down upon me and my sinfulness and judge me and condemn me and God's that way. He's a tyrant and 
He just wants to condemn me. Well, I'd show him this verse. That's not why Christ came in this first coming. Now, don't get me wrong. In the second coming, he will come with the sword and he will judge those who have rejected him and blasphemed him. And uh, he will do so. But his first coming, he didn't come to condemn the world. He came for a purpose. Notice this. But that the world through him might be saved. He wanted to reconcile the world unto himself. All those who would believe in the Son. The Father sent him on a mission. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is a condemnation that the light has come into the world. But men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. It's the fault of the unbeliever who has rejected Christ when he doesn't see that the Savior came to save them. God allows them, the unbeliever, to go their own way. And one day they will end up in a place called the Lake of Fire. I know that's not popular today, but it's biblical. Very biblical. But you know what? You don't have to go there because God did not send his son to condemn you. That's not the purpose why Christ came. He came so that you might have life. And even Jesus said, have it what? More abundantly. He is the one whom God sent. He originated from heaven. He is the bread of life. And he can give you eternal life if you simply place your faith in him. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the Savior who is sent from God. Lord, even though there were those who did not recognize the prophetic scripture concerning his Messiahship, ignored the word of God, we pray, Lord, that we might recognize and see. Thank you for the clarity that we have by looking in the scripture the things concerning the Son. We pray, Father, that other individuals might have this clarity that they might see their need for salvation and place their faith in the only one who can give them eternal life. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.